What we call semen is actually a combination of a whole bunch of different secretions from a whole bunch of different places, primarily from the seminal glands and the prostate glands. Uh, but there are some secretions that come very early in the life of the sperm. So the nurse cells that are uh, in the seminiferous tubules produce some secretions, as does the epididymis. Um, but again, the, uh, the seminal glands produce the majority uh, of the volume of the semen. And there are a lot of things in that um, secretion, but a um, huge part of it is sugars that are there for... Um, uh, for energy, right, to keep the, the sperm going. The sperm are not packing their own energy. It has to come along with them in the semen. Uh, and also some alkaline solutions so that the uh, sperm don't get too acidic. And this is what that looks like. Um, these are all secretary uh, epithelial cells. The next most important or uh, gland or, or the, the gland that produces the next most fluid, at least, is this the prostate. And the prostate um, is uh, wrapped around the urethra or just beneath the bladder. And it produces, again, many different things, lots of proteins that have various functions, but uh, that includes something called seminal plasmin, or sorry, seminal plasmin. And seminal plasmin has antibiotic properties uh, to prevent urinary tract infections in males. Additionally, as we mentioned before, the bulbourethral gland, sometimes called the Cowper's gland, uh, located just at the base of the penis where the membranous urethra is, um, it produces a pre-ejaculate that is uh, alkaline to neutralize the urethra uh, because of the, the urine that has passed through before, and it also lubricates the head of the penis. The penis itself has two main functions. One is to conduct semen into the vagina, and the, the second is to conduct urine to the, let's say, toilet. Um, it has a root that is you know, in the body, well, not the body of the penis. It has a root that is within the, the pelvic cavity and then a body that's, that's the external part. And then the head of the penis is called the glans penis. And around the outside of that, uh, you have the prepuce, which is foreskin. And this is a different look at that. You can see that there are also um, two types of spongy tissue within the penis. So in the bottom, right around the urethra, uh, it's called the corpus spongiosum. And then above that, there are two corpora cavernosa. So singular corpus cavernosum, but there are two of them. And so they are the corpora cavernosa. And those are the spongy tissues that fill up with blood during erection. This is a cross section of that. And you can see the two corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum. Uh, and this is the urethra right there. I know this looks a little bit like an alien. Um, you can also see the deep arteries of the penis and then the veins up here. These uh, are what bring the blood in to fill this tissue up during erection. The sexual response in males has three main phases. The first is arousal. Um, and so this is when the male will get an erection, so blood will begin to flow into the penis. And this happens because of a release of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. So it dilates the arteries in the penis, which brings more blood in. And the more blood comes in, it also sort of uh, squishes the veins and prevents blood from being able to get out very quickly. And so that's how you maintain an erection. Um, fun fact, there was um, a company that was working on a blood pressure medication a while back. And you know, there's a lot of money in blood pressure medication because there are a lot of people in the United States with high blood pressure. And they were doing clinical trials and the blood pressure medication was a vasodilator because if you dilate all of the vessels in the body, more volume, blood pressure goes down. Uh, and it wasn't particularly effective at reducing blood pressure, um, but they did have a curious side effect. Uh, and it was that a lot of the male uh, participants wound up finding themselves getting erections. And that was the origin story of Viagra. Arousal is a function of the parasympathetic nervous division, and this seems counterintuitive, right? You think sympathetic nervous division is getting worked up, right? But uh, really, the first part where you become aroused requires some relaxation, and, and it makes sense because uh, if you are in a fight-or-flight mode, right, that's not a time when you're going to stop to have sex because you're in a pretty vulnerable position. So your parasympathetic nervous division is in charge of this initial arousal. The sympathetic division 
uh, takes over next when you get to the second phase, which is a mission. This is when the sperm leave the uh, epididymis and they go through um, the ductus deferens and through the prostatic urethra. This is not ejaculation, but this is when the sperm begin moving and begin mixing with the semen. Uh, the third and final phase is ejaculation, and this is a series of rhythmic muscular contractions that will push the semen out. Um, and the male orgasm is associated with those muscular contractions. Uh, the female organism, orgasm is also associated with muscular contractions, uh, but those will happen in the uterus, and those can cause the uterus to uh, be able to draw sperm up uh, into the uterus so they have a better chance of getting where they need to go. All of this is ultimately hormonally regulated, and uh, as we remember from the very first chapter of this semester, it all starts at the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus releases something called gonadotropin releasing hormone, and that will target, as you might guess, the anterior pituitary and it will cause the anterior pituitary to release its gonadotropins, which are luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And those names will make more sense when we talk about the female reproductive system momentarily. In males, luteinizing hormone targets the interstitial cells of the testes. And if you recall, the interstitial cells of the testes produce testosterone and some other androgens. So luteinizing hormone causes production of testosterone. Follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates the nurse cells within the seminiferous tubules, which produce something called androgen binding protein, which allows these cells to bind to testosterone, and that stimulates spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. So both testosterone and androgen binding protein are necessary for the production of sperm. And this is a general look at your hypothalamus, your anterior pituitary, and the testes, and the feedback uh, mechanisms that occur here, right? The more testosterone you produce, um, this inhibits the secretion of GnRH uh, in a negative feedback mechanism. In addition to driving the production of sperm, testosterone also has a lot of peripheral effects. Um, it has behavioral effects, so it's related to sex drive, uh, and, and uh, you know, there are lots of behaviors that you probably associate with testosterone, and a lot of those are actually associated with testosterone. It also stimulates bone and muscle growth uh, and establishes male secondary sex characteristic, characteristics. So things like deeper voice and uh, hair on the face and under the arms and in the pubic area. Um, and most of those things are what show up in puberty uh, once you start secreting GnRH, therefore FSH and LH, and, and therefore excess testosterone. Now let's shift gears and start talking about the female reproductive system. So the primary female reproductive organs are the female gonads, and those are the ovaries, and they produce gametes, which in this case are eggs or ova. They also produce sex hormones like uh, estrogen and progesterone. Um, and the female reproductive system, while similar, is going to have some differences with the male reproductive system. The male reproductive system really only has to produce the gamete and deliver it to the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system has to then take care of the developing embryo and fetus uh, and then birth it at the end, and so you need some extra organs. Also, not all, but the majority of the female reproductive system is internal. So we'll start with the female gonads, the primary sex organs, which are the ovaries uh, that produce the oocytes and also produce sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone, and the uterus, which is the primary site uh, that cares for and supports the growing embryo and fetus. The uterine tubes you're probably more familiar with as fallopian tubes, and those deliver the oocyte to the uterus. And the vagina, which is the entrance canal for sperm and the exit canal for a baby and also for menstrual fluids. The external genitalia is called the vulva and it includes labia, uh, both labia minora on in the inside, and labia majora on the outside, uh, and the clitoris uh, at the top, which uh, contains some erectile tissue. 
And then the mammary glands are not sex organs, but they are reproductive organs because they're important for nourishing the infant. The ovary is going to look a little bit on the outside like a testis because it has this tunica albuginea on the outside, that white coat. But on the inside, it looks very different. It doesn't have these tiny seminiferous tubules divided by septa. Instead, it has uh, eggs at various stages of development. Adjacent to, but not attached to the ovary, is the uterine tube, or fallopian tube, which leads to the uterus. The uterus itself has three layers of tissue, the endometrium on the inside, the myometrium, made of muscle in the middle, and the parametrium around the outside. The bottom of the uterus sticks down into the vagina, or vaginal canal, and it's called the cervix. Uh, this canal is the vagina, and it leads to the external genitalia. Uh, and again, this is the vulva. It includes both the uh, labia minora and labia majora, and up here you can see the clitoris. The bladder and urethra are not part of the reproductive system, but they are adjacent to the reproductive system. So you can see the bladder here and the urethra and the external urethral orifice in the front, and then the uh, entrance to the vagina, and then in the back you can see the anus um, that leads to the rectum. From the front you can see uh, the ovary attached to the uterus by the ovarian ligament. is one on both sides. Uh, there's also a suspensory ligament, which holds the ovary to the body wall. You've got one of those on both sides. You can see the uterine tube here. Uh, and you can see the, the fundus of the uterus, which is the hump on top, the body of the uterus, which is the main part. And at the bottom, you have the cervix, which again is the part of the uterus that sticks down into the vagina. Uh, this is the external os, the outer hole that goes through the cervical canal. And you can see that the vagina has rugi, or uh, folds, just like the stomach does. And just like the stomach, it uses them to be able to expand, right? It has extra tissue uh, for expansion. Now, the parametrium of the uterus, just like um, the outer layer of the intestines, is part of that peritoneal membrane, it's the visceral peritoneum. And just like in the intestines, that visceral peritoneum extends and holds different uh, folds of the intestines together, um, and we call it the mesentery. Here we have extensions of the visceral peritoneum that hold the uterus and the ovaries to nearby structures, and we call this primarily the broad ligament, this big part. This little part of the broad ligament up here by the ovary we call the mesovarium. The, mesovarium. the primary job of the ovary is to produce eggs. And just like the production of sperm is called spermatogenesis, the production of eggs is called oogenesis. And broadly, the um, way this happens is, is pretty much the same, but there are some, some very marked differences. Um, first of all, oogenesis begins before you are even born. When you are in your fifth or sixth month, you are already making your own eggs, or at least starting their production. Uh, and then it accelerates at puberty, ends at menopause, and it, it is um, a thing that, that cycles monthly. Um, whereas sperm is made consistently throughout the life from puberty until um, uh, climacteric, which is a hormonal change that happens late in men's life when they stop producing sperm. Aside from timing, the other big difference between spermatogenesis and oogenesis is in the products. So the nuclear events are the same. Meiosis goes essentially the same way. But from one primary spermatocyte, you get four sperm. From one primary oocyte, you only get one adult viable egg. And that's because every time there's a meiotic division, so meiosis one and again a meiosis two, one of the two cells that divides takes almost all of the cytoplasm and organelles. And the reason for that is the final egg is going to support the conceptus through through a good chunk of the early, early development. And so you don't want to waste all that cytoplasm. Sperm don't need a lot of cytoplasm, right? They want to be light and travel quickly. Um, eggs, uh, when you divide them, one of them keeps a ton of cytoplasm. The other keeps just a little bit, is mostly just nuclear material. Same thing with the second division. And so you end up getting a viable cell and what's called a polar body uh, in each division. So from one primary oocyte, you get one functional cell and two to three polar bodies. Now we'll dig into this process in a little bit more detail in the next video.